everyone, this is Dr. Daniel Brisky from Colorado Surgical Institute. So today I want to talk a little bit about picking helium abutment versus a cover screw. Uh, what scenarios would be best for each one? Uh, one of the most common mistakes that we see during our classes is where to put the incision line. So uh, for example, when making an incision uh, for placing just one implant, whether it's the top or the bottom, you want to make sure, you want to see where mid crestal is, so we're in the center of the ridge, exactly where the middle of the ridge is. Now, you want to make your incision slightly lingualized, so you can do it about one to two millimeters um, more lingual than the mid crestal, right? So just slightly more lingualized. So instead of like right here, which would be like, rather than mid crestal, which it would be about here, you want it about a millimeter past that, or one to two millimeters more lingual. Um, then once you place the implant, the top of the implant in this scenario, um, if you were to actually put the lingual tissue back down and peek underneath it, um, right, you'll see that it really lies on the lingual side. If you, if you peek back the lingual, lingual tissue and see how that buccal tissue really goes over the top of the implant, like a majority of it, I'd say about three-fourths. Uh, almost 80% of the implant is covered with tissue. Now, the reason that you do the slightly lingualized is because of this reason. You have more buccal tissue that will be covering the inside of the implant. Uh, if you were to make the, the incision more mid-crestal, then you would have less tissue, more like this, about half of it uh, covering the top of the implant. So that means when you go to suture, if you have a mid-crustal incision, the middle, of the, the middle of the incision will be over the middle of the implant. Uh, and early on in our surgical careers, uh, sometimes we're not as good at suturing as we think we are, uh, which is okay. And with inflammation, after inflammation goes up and goes back down, it can leave a little bit of an opening here. Now, what you don't want to have happen is for the opening to be the opening in the tissue to be right over the top of your implant because bacteria can go right on top of the implant and cause periimplantitis and that's how you lose bone before the implant even becomes healed. But if you make more of a lingualized incision about two, but one to two millimeters at least, uh, I say about two millimeters is what I do, then the bulk of the keratized tissue will be covering the top of the implant. So if you do get, an, uh, if you do get a small pinpoint opening, uh, at least it won't be over the top of the implant. Now, a mistake we see sometimes in classes, and this is usually on the maxilla, is if you make an incision too lingualized, right here. If you do that, the good news is at least the bulk of the keratinized tissue will be covering the entire implant. However, when you go to screw in your healing abutment, what you're gonna notice is You'll go to suture this, but then this gets bulked up like this, where the tissue is trying to go over the top of the healing abutment, and where you're gonna get some spaces of opening where the bone can be exposed. That's not good. The reason is if the tissue is bunched over the top of the healing abutment, bacteria can get underneath there. Now if bacteria gets between the tissue and the healing abutment, that means it's not cleansable. If it's not cleansable, that's how you get bone loss. You start to get a soft tissue infection and that soft tissue infection will go to the implant and you'll have bone loss around your implant before it's even healed. So, now if you do choose to do more of a lingualized incision, this type of incision is meant for a cover screw. So we have, uh, what we teach is you can do it more mid-crustal uh, and sl just slightly more lingual, so lingualized incision. That's gonna be for your healing abutment. If you wanna do an, an incision for a cover screw, you're going to really make this more lingualized on the maxilla, and the bulk of this tissue is gonna cover the entire implant. So this will protect the, the, the implant even if a small exposure happens. So either scenario is okay, it just really feel, depends on how comfortable you feel. Uh, if you want to start doing cover screws or start doing healing abutments. Uh, personally speaking, um, I love healing abutments. I'll put a healing abutment on any time that the stability of the implant uh, is at 25 newton centimeters or greater. Uh, the reason is we're having only one surgery uh, for the patient. So if you put a healing abutment on 
Um, you're not having to re-enter the site. Uh, and also you're just letting the tissue just heal right around the healing abutment, which is nice. Um, I think it's easier to put two, two, two uh, simple interrupted uh, sutures on one on each side and that'll hold it together. In the beginning, what happens is if you try to do cover screw, if your suturing isn't perfect, you can get opening, right? And if you get an opening, you can get bone loss. So I think it's a little bit risky. Now let's talk about size selection for a healing abutment. Because like we were saying earlier, if the healing abutment is too short, the tissue can go over the top of it and you can get bacteria that gets stuck between the tissue and the healing abutment. And that's how you get bone loss. So with all neodent implants or a majority of implants, you're gonna have an implant that's one millimeter below the bone. And in this scenario, we're about one and a half, uh, almost two. So uh, neonet does make a small uh, tool called a, a height, a tissue height measurer, which is this. And with this, well, the only two markings that I really pay attention to are the on the top of the tissue measurer, the right between these two black lines. The top of this black line is a 3.5, and the bottom of this black line is a 4.5. Uh, your average healing abutment size is going to be a 3.5 height. A 2.5 is not as common uh, because you're going to be placing your implant at least one millimeter below the bone. Uh, so in an average scenario, you're going to have one millimeter of bone and you're going to have at least two millimeters of soft tissue. That would equal three, right? So having two and a half is usually pretty, is usually too short. So what you can do is you can stick it, this one, just screw it right into the top of the implant and you can approximate the tissue. And then this one, it's really going to about the middle of that black line. So on this one, the bottom of that top black line is 4.5. Now let's say I stick too short of one on there. Let's say I go to put a 3.5 on. So this one is a 3.5. Okay, so if I reapproximate the tissue with the 3.5, what you're gonna notice is it's a, little bit, it's a little bit below the bone and the tissue is trying to go over the top of the healing abutment. We see a lot of this place at our, at our courses. Uh, this is the first doctor's first instinct is to put one on, but usually it's too short of one. And again, what can happen is bacteria can go underneath the healing abutment and go underneath the tissue and cause a soft tissue infection around the implant you just placed. So this type of scenario where it's that short, we don't wanna go with that. I'm gonna go with one millimeter higher. So this one, we're gonna put a taller one on. And now, when we go to approximate the tissue, you can see how the tissue very nicely adapts around the healing bubble in this scenario. Right there, so you can see the entire healing abutment um, and the tissue is not gonna be propped over the top of the healing abutment. Hence, when you suture, you're not going to have bacteria that gets trapped uh, below it. So in this scenario, once you find the correct height, we're gonna place two sutures, one on, one on each side of the implant is what I usually do. When I'm suturing, I like to use a tissue forcep when I'm grabbing stuff. that tail a little bit shorter so it's easier to suture. Make sure you grab at least three millimeters beyond the free gingival, that, uh, the keratinized tissue border there. So you have enough tissue to grab onto. So the suture, my favorite suture is a, a, is a PGCL. This is a PGCL. Also my other type of, type of, type of suture I love is a glycolon suture, which is a pretty close to the same thing. Now when you're suturing, um, what you want to notice is you're going to see how the suture just lays down 
Uh, and same thing in the beginning, uh, you really have to pay, pay attention to this, forward to this so that way when you send your, your suture down, it doesn't just open right back up. So if I was tying this down and it looked like this, this where you can see like a little backwards knot, that's not correct. You want it to be laying straight down on the little bow. So this one, you go down. Now with a PGCL or a glycolon suture, you can actually do two uh, forward, one back, one forward, and see how this is a little loop again. And it goes right back down again and lays right on top of it. And I go forward now. And another, another little bow and goes right down again. So my knot is very tiny. It doesn't look like a big bunched up knot. So we'll clip these about three millimeters away from the knot. And that's what I want the suture to look like. Nice and small and kept down. Do the same thing on the other side. And again, I would want to use the tissue forceps when I'm grabbing it, but on the model it's a little harder because <laughs> the model moves. So on this one, same thing. Make sure you don't leave your tail too tall because then you're just, we're just being wasteful. So go one, two, and same thing. Then we try to figure out where are we, right? Does it need to be here or here? So on this one, you can tell same thing, same motion. You see where the suture is just going right down. And one backwards. And do one forward. And, this. and then right before you let the patient go, you always want to make sure when you're looking at the tissue that it's not moving. It needs to be nice and taut. So if I'm squeezing this right here, you can see there's nothing moving here. So I know that this is nice and tied down. If the tissue is mobile, or what you could do another test would be if you can stick your instrument underneath here, and if you can lift up and almost make a, if you can make a few millimeters of room of space there, uh, that means that once inflammation happens, it's going to open. So you have more tissue opening. Hence, bacteria can get around it. So right after the patient, right before the patient is ready to leave, um, I'll actually irrigate this surgical site to be nice and clean. I use Closis instead of Paradex. So Paradex um, was originally made in, I think it was like 1950s, and it was actually uh, an irrigant on the bottom of a submarine. So they actually used, to make, they made it an irrigant to clean the bottom of a submarine. The solution like Paradex was, was meant to be used for a temporary solution to, for, to clean uh, an area, but it's only temporary. It's only meant to be used for about two week period of time. Never beyond that. Uh, Paradex does have an anti-fibrinolytic effect. You are placing an implant, so using a rinse that inhibits bone growth is not a very smart choice. Uh, so what I use is Closis. Uh, Closis is a very friendly liquid. It's actually hypochlorous acid. Uh, hypochlorous acid, if you've ever seen, uh, during COVID time, you saw those fogger machines on an, on an airplane that actually had hypochlorous acid in it. That's what this is. It's been around for like 20 years and I think things get rebranded and no one really knows what things really are. So this is a very uh, friendly irrigant. It's a wound cleaner. It's not gonna inhibit bone growth. It's just going to clean the surgical site uh, where we want to keep bacteria from having. So right before the patient leaves, I clean the surgical site on the top of it. Um, what I'll also do is I'll place an antibiotic gel. This antibiotic gel is metronidazole. Uh, I'll place a little bit of metronidazole on my glove, uh, just a tiny bit, about the size of a pea, and then I'll tap it on the surgical site, and then I'll have the patient bite down on a two by two, um, and then the patient leaves. So I know when the patient leaves that we selected the correct height of healing abutment, right? Uh, that we tied it down correctly, and with inflammation, it's not going to open up. Um, and right before the patient left, we rinsed it the, with a wound cleaner to make sure there's no excess bacteria. And then I actually placed an antibiotic as well. <laughs> so several different steps that we're going to consider uh, to make sure the patient doesn't get periimplantitis right from the start of their visit. Now, some other reasons I'd say picking a cover screw versus, versus a healing abutment. I think a lot of the time it really depends on your comfort level. Uh, if you want to place 
cover screws for the first 20 cases, that is perfectly okay. I would just consider making an incision that's meant for a cover screw. So for example, like we were just talking about, make the incision much more lingual for the maxillary area. So that way when you cover, uh, when you do go to put your sutures, that you have this entire bulk of keratinized tissue covering the top of the implant. So that way, if you do get some inflammation, right, because again, in the beginning, we're not going to be perfect at suturing. We're going to be pretty, pretty decent, pretty average. Uh, so everyone, I really want you to consider practicing on models like here and making your, uh, making your, making sure you're very intentional about how your sutures lay down. Uh, so if you do cover screw again, same thing, bulk of the tissue is going to cover it. So if you get a little bit of inflammation, it's okay. It's a little bit more forgiving of an incision. Uh, now, if you're going to be placing healing abutments, this is the exact same incision I make. So you find mid-crustal and you go about two millimeters beyond mid-crustal, so a little bit more lingualized. Um, maybe consider doing your first 20 cases if you'd like to with cover screws. I do advise everyone that comes through the Surgical Institute to place a lot of healing abutments just doing a mixture, getting good at uh, you know, suturing and making incisions for a cover screw or being intentional about it uh, because you will have some tissue, some cases that are more soft in terms of the bone. And beginning in the beginning, you may not get uh, stability of your implant uh, because in the beginning, we don't know how soft bone is. We don't know if it's D1, D2, D3, or D4. Once you start getting a little bit better of understanding the bone density, you'll be able to put an implant in uh, and with higher stability. So when that happens, you'll start to use a few more healing abutments in your regimen. Um, picking too tall of a healing abutment is okay, <laughs> but just make sure we're not picking too short of a healing abutment where the tissue goes over the top. Um, hope these tips are helpful, and we'll talk to you later.